joy to be with you, especially those who may be visiting, the guests who are with us. We thank you for sharing and for worship at First Church this morning. And we simply remind you of the registration pads that you find to your left, right, and your signing of those. It's helpful for us to know that you share and worship here this morning. As we gather for worship, I hope we are mindful of opportunities which are before us. The Jams ministry resumes after church this morning at the Labor Day weekend call. As do the ministries of the children's choirs and puppets tomorrow. Uh, there will be a uh, commission meeting on Wednesday evening at 6 o'clock. I forward to sharing with that and learning more about the impact of humanity. But also, I'm hoping that on Tuesday at 4 o'clock, uh, you may feel led to be a part of a presentation from Martha Stokes. Martha has long been a very active and gifted member, a lay member of the Virginia Conference that has held various positions of leadership. She is now with Pinnacle Living, and she will be with us in the Uptown Ministry Center Tuesday at 4 o'clock uh, to speak of retirement through a spiritual lens. So I'm hoping to see you there. Uh, we are blessed to have Martha with us and all for that presentation. Uh, and I'm sure she will do very well. Remember the ministry of the food bank and clothes closet next Saturday morning, 8.30 at the Ministry Center. And remember as well the study of living faithfully that began a week from Tuesday, 7 o'clock in the fellowship hall downstairs. Still time to sign up for that. We still have folks in the church office and I look forward to sharing in that six-week study with you beginning on September the 18th. As we gather for worship this morning, we share some accounts of healing, first from Isaiah 35, then from Mark chapter 7. So the words before us on our bulletins speak to the healing power of Christ. Power that we know as we gather for worship this morning, and I invite us now to prepare to worship God together.
Jesus said, ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Friends in Christ, God knows our needs before we ask. And in our asking prepares us to receive. God ministers to us not as one who is absent, but as one who is present in human hands, voices, and lives full of the Holy Spirit. Let us open our lives to God's healing presence among us, working through us even though we might not understand. Let us cry out with tenacious faith. Christ responds, I do choose. Let us sing. Our Old Testament lesson 
this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 35, verses 1 through 7. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and sing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing for joy. For water shall break forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. The haunt of jackals shall become a swamp, the grass shall become reeds and rushes. The word of God for the people of God.
It comes from Ecclesiastes 3, and that's in the Old Testament, the first half of the Bible. And in Ecclesiastes, we read that there is a time for everything under heaven. There's a time to be sad and a time to be happy, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to plant and a time to harvest or pick vegetables, and that God has a time for everything, like a time for sunny days and then a time for rainy days like today. And they're all important and they're all given by God. And so even though today is my last day and it's a sad day that I won't be here next Sunday, but that doesn't mean that we didn't have wonderful, fun, happy, dancing days before. And that doesn't mean that you won't have wonderful, fun, happy, dancing days again. Because when God moves one person out of your life, he puts wonderful people in their place. And so I look forward to seeing you grow. And I know that there are many wonderful people that you are going to meet throughout your life that God is going to put in your place, put in your path, so that you meet them and that they share their love with you. And they lead you to know him even more. So we thank God for all of the days that he has for us. The sunny, wonderful days and the rainy days. Because they're all important and they're all given to us by God. And I'm so happy that I know each and every one of your beautiful faces. And I know each of your smiles, even if I don't see them this morning. So let's pray. Will you repeat after me? Dear Lord, we thank you for your perfect timing. For the way you love us and lead us, whether it's raining or the sun is shining. We love you, Lord. Amen. All right, you can go to Children's Church. It was a man.
this morning comes from the book of Mark, chapter 7, verses 24 through 37. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and would not have anyone know it. Yet he could not be hid. But immediately a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the children first be fed, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this saying, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed, and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee, through the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. And they besought him to lay his hand upon him. And taking him aside from the multitude privately, he put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. And looked up to heaven, he sighed, and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And he charged them to tell no one, but the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the dumb speak. The word of God for the people. Thanks be to God. Well, as we anticipate beginning our stewardship campaign next Sunday, I'm reminded of the story of the member of a certain church who with great passion and with a copy of the church budget in his hand approached the pastor of his church one day. The pastor man said, I'd like you to break down this budget for me. The pastor replied, well, the budget broke down last year, won't that do? <laughs> and this man did not appreciate the humor of his pastor an experience I know all too well. And he said to his pastor, you know what I mean. I'm looking at our missions budget here. Does any of this money we give to foreign missions go to communist nations? The pastor replied, well, if the people in those nations are cold or hungry, we try to give them food and blankets. Well, continued the man flipping through the pages, what about this money for this shelter for unwed mothers? You know, we shouldn't be condoning this kind of behavior. Pastor tried to reply as best he could. The budget's really not about judging behavior. It's, it's about trying to, to help where there is need. The gentleman rolled up his budget walked away. I'm not in favor of it, he said. You know, I'm not in favor of it. Well, as displeased as we may be, by the behavior of this church member, we understand. Whether we believe it to be right or not, we like for those who we support by our gifts to both be those who are somehow worthy, somehow deserving, somehow virtuous. We don't want our gifts falling into undeserving hands. We don't want to support wrong behavior. We like our gifts to be well managed, Appreciated. So we understand the sentiments of this church member. You see, while we gladly affirm gifts of charity and grace, we still like to measure our control over our gifts. But then here comes Jesus, recklessly and haphazardly and lavishly dishing out grace to all manner of unworthy and unacceptable persons. All of this leading me to confess that as I continue to serve as pastor of a local church, 
I become increasingly aware that we're not so much troubled by what Jesus said as we are by what Jesus did. I mean, we eagerly treasure the words of Jesus, the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the peacemakers, we, we treasure his parables. There was a certain father who had two sons. We love the I am statements of Jesus as found in the Gospel of John. I am the good shepherd. We, we love these words of Jesus. It appears in many ways, as long as Jesus only speaks, he troubles us not at all. But then Jesus dares go beyond speaking. We worshiped last Sunday. We shared in the celebration of the Lord's Supper, the Great Thanksgiving. And in this prayer of Great Thanksgiving, we name those ways in which Jesus troubles us as he has troubled people of faith from the very beginning. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor. To proclaim release to the captive, the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. This scripture we share this morning, witnessing to Jesus' healing of his Gentile, foreign, non Jewish woman, and his graphic, earthly, intimate healing of this deaf man with a speech impediment. Well, it illustrates the trouble we have with Jesus. Now, this is not scripture popping up out of nowhere, but scripture continuing a theme recently front and center in the Gospel of Mark. It is a theme, a concern as to what is clean and what is unclean. That is, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable to God. This concern is first addressed regarding the subject of food. That is to say, what foods are acceptable for those chosen by God, and what foods are to be avoided by those set aside as the holy people of God. Now, it may be this sounds a minor issue to you and me who eat everything, but Scripture makes clear this issue of what is to be eaten and what is not to be eaten. It's an important concern. It's a defining matter for the people of God. What one eats and with whom one eats is at the heart of defining who the people of God are and how they are to live. So it's important to define what is clean and important to define what is not clean. The theme remains before us, yet this theme moves from the issue of food to the issue of, well, you and me. After this argument with religious leaders regarding what makes us clean or unclean, Jesus, trying to escape the gathering crowds, is confronted by a woman whose little daughter has an unclean spirit. This woman worships Jesus, falls at his feet. This woman, we are told, is a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth. She is clearly an outsider. She is clearly a foreigner. This woman is to be considered unclean. But not only is she unclean, she is persistent, terribly persistent. We notice Jesus responds to this woman's request for the healing of her daughter in a manner we may consider cold, uncaring, heartless. It appears Jesus' refusal to heal this woman's daughter. And not only that, Jesus appears to insult the woman. Loving Jesus, meek and mild, says to this mother who wants nothing other than the healing of her daughter possessed of an unclean spirit, Jesus says to her, it's not right to give the children's food to the dogs. Pastoral care, according to Jesus. My goodness. Now, such a response as this from Jesus of all persons, understandably, would drive away the most desperate of parents. 
I mean, the very reason this woman falls before Jesus is because he has shown compassion to the sick. He has given life to the dead. Certainly, she does not expect Jesus to respond to her in a manner so cold and uncaring. We would understand were she to be defeated by these words of Jesus. We would understand if she were to walk dejectedly away saying, he was my last hope. I don't know what to do for my daughter now. But that's not the response of this desperate mother. Not the response of this Gentile, foreign, Syrophoenician, unclean woman. To this Jesus who rightly proclaims he is in service to the God of Israel, this desperate mother grabs Jesus, won't let him go. It is as if Jesus has met his match. You say it's not right to give the children's food to the dogs. But even the dogs get the crumbs from under the table. The woman goes home. Her child is lying dead. The unclean spirit has gone. Jesus has healed her daughter. But he's done much more, hasn't he? He's done more than this. You see, this is more than a physical healing. This is more than driving an unclean spirit from the daughter of this woman, though that would appear to be sufficient. Yet this is a miracle impacting more than just this woman and her daughter. Notice what Jesus does here as he heals this woman's daughter. He breaks through well-established and long-standing social barriers. He breaks down walls. He welcomes those who to this point have been unwelcome. He witnesses to this message at the heart of his ministry. It is the will and purpose of God that his healing and salvation is known to all. There's no restriction, no limit, no expiration date, no condition placed upon the salvation and healing of God. If we miss this message with this Syrophoenician woman, it's a message echoed in this healing story which follows. In this story, Jesus is brought into the company of a man who is deaf, a man with a speech impediment. Jesus is begged to lay his hand upon this man. But for whatever reason, Jesus decides laying his hand upon this man is not enough. It goes far beyond the laying of his hand. You see, Jesus takes this deaf and speech-impaired man aside. He puts his fingers into his ears. He spits. He touches his tongue. Looking up to heaven, Jesus sighs, says to the man, Ephetha, be open. The man's ears are opened, his tongue is released, he speaks plainly. God won't stop, will he? God will not stop short of anything and everything so as to save all he has made. Ours is not a God distant at arm's length. Ours is not some antiseptic God hermetically sealed. Untouched, uncaring about those he has made in his image. For the outsider as much as the insider. For those who do not belong as much as for those who do belong. For non-members as well as members. For those foreigners as well as for those within our own family. For those who don't look like us as well as for those who do. For those who don't know the hymns, the prayers, the confessions, the affirmations, as well as for those who do. For those of us clean as for well as for those of us unclean, for all of us. This is true. It is God who cleanses all. It is God who makes us clean. 
It is God who removes all things separating us from God. It is God who places His hands upon us, touching us, wiping away tears, making us to see, to hear, to speak, saying, Be open. A certain woman of faith named Heather Burke Cody recalls a recent conversation with her pastor. She shares with us this conversation, telling us there's the man who speaks in the back, sneaks in the back door of the church, fresh off the street, after the service starts, and he leaves before the altar call. The people sitting close complain about how bad he smells of beer, of smoke, of sweat. But the pastor tells me he doesn't know what to say. And then there's a the young mama who wears dirty clothing and lets her four children come in and eat all the donuts and drink all the juice. While the mama just stands there and lets them. Some church staff say they eat like little pigs, like they haven't eaten in weeks. The elders say something must be done and said. But the pastor tells me he doesn't know what to say. And then there's the prostitute sitting among the faithful. And everyone knows her. She sits with a painted up face, cheap perfume, the broken heart. And those who sit close, well, they treat her for what they think she is. And in the last half meeting, her name came up. Something must be done about her. But the pastor tells me he doesn't know what to say. The pastor is a good man, holy and just. And he wants to do the right, loving thing, and he wants to look like Jesus. And he asked me if I had any thoughts on anything he could say. Yes, sweet pastor, I do. Start with this and say it louder than any other words. Welcome to church. This is a place of hope and love and safety and forgiveness. We will be food for the hungry, living water for the thirsty. We are so glad you are here. You are invited. You are loved. Come on in. We've been waiting on you. Welcome you. We are the church. Say that to the called and to the called out. To the leaders and the greeters, to the dirty and the clean, we are all the same. We are. She then offers this prayer. May we blow the dust of religion out of our souls and to choose affection instead. May our words and actions and reactions be a sanctuary for all. Jesus broke many laws to love, so Jesus, be our voice. Be the only words we should ever speak. As a response to the word, I'll invite us to pray this intercessory prayer. We see it as a response to prayer, speaking again to our healing God. I'll invite us to stand.
for those whose lives are broken by distress. For those whose lives are broken by fear. For those whose lives are broken by anger. For those whose lives are broken by a pain. For those whose lives are broken by illness. For those whose lives are broken by sin. God of healing, gently touch these lives with your spirit. Bring warmth and comfort, life and wholeness, and restoration in the fractured lives and souls. Amen. Please be seated. And as Megan has shared with our children, and as you've been aware for some weeks now, this will be Megan's last Sunday with us. So we feel that as this community of faith, to all for our appreciation, and to all for this order of farewell from Megan, and you will see words that I will offer, you see the response that we as this community of faith will offer as well, and then I will conclude. Craig Compton is Staff Parish Religion, Staff Parish Relations Committee Chair. So Fred, thank you. Church is a family, united by the common recognition of Jesus Christ as our Savior, we are all brothers and sisters. And for a time, First United Methodist is our home. Like every human family, our church family is formed and reformed over time. As members are born, as they die, as members are adopted into our family, and as they leave our congregation for a new home, in a different place. For a time, Megan has lived with us. We have shared with each other good times and bad. We have shared each other's joys and sorrows. We have liked each other's heavy loads. Together we have laughed and cried. Together we have worshipped and praised God. Together we have lived. And if you will, we feel sorrow and relief. Be sure to keep in touch and um, more people seem interested in keeping Madeline in touch. 
much, so I'll be sure to bring her around and you can watch her as she grows as well. So I thank you for your love and care, and I know that God has great things planned for you as a body of Christ as well. So I will be praying for, for you, my first church family, that God will watch over you and bring the perfect people into your lives to, to continue the work that God is doing among you today. So I thank you for your love and your support, and I will be praying for you and I as well. Megan and the head of the church, a small token. God bless you. Certainly during the passing of the peace, we would invite you to, to share your affection for Megan. I've also asked Megan to stand with me at the conclusion of the service. So as you leave this time of worship, you may wish to speak to Megan as well. But I invite us now to share the passing of the peace.
Jesus calls us to be people of prayer who ask and seek and knock. Those words are still before us as we go to God at this time and the prayers of the people. It is a responsive time of prayer, a time in which I will name various petitions, concluding each with the words, Lord, in your mercy, inviting from you, in response to our prayer, and inviting you to name those concerns, names that you would like to speak as we go to God in prayer as this community of faith. Let us pray. Father, our presence here this morning is witness to just how much you love us. Witness to the good news that you have made us clean. Witness to the fact that you are a God of new beginnings, that the old has passed away, and all is now new. Our presence here is witness to the fact you are a healing God, that nothing is beyond your ability, your power, your desire to heal and to make new. Remind us, Lord, that though we be unworthy, though we be unclean, though we be alien and distant from you, you break through all barriers, break through all boundaries so as to make us your own. As we worship this morning, as we gather ourselves at this time and place to witness, to pray, to sing, to confess, to affirm, may we also be saying to you, thank you. Thank you for a love so profound, so deep, and so transforming. And help us, Lord, to be faithful witnesses beyond this place to all that we hear proclaim. Lord, in your mercy, and hear us, Lord, as we pray for the people of this congregation. Lord, in your mercy. Lord. Hear us, Lord, as we pray for those who suffer and for those in trouble. Lord, in your mercy.
We are gathered in this place because of God's profound love for us. It is a love we are called to take beyond this place as we take this life into dark places and live according to the words of Christ, you are the light of the world. Go now in peace in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm.